Hello, welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host, Brian. Now, this week we are revisiting bands that we've listened to before, or I'm revisiting bands I've listened to before, um, with the stipulation that I've only listened to the band once. Uh, I know we've had a lot of ginger and system of down on this channel. I think we've done um, Bring Me the Horizon three times. Uh, so those those bands are out of the running. It's uh, the stuff that I've listened to once I said I would, re would return to, but I just haven't gotten around to that yet. So that's where we're going to be at for today and uh, oh, for this week. And today we're going to start off with Spirit Box. Uh, this one is wildly popular in my request to return to them. And uh, the most popular request easily is uh, the Mara effect, all three parts, preferably the live play as it's the only time, or I guess it's the easiest way to listen to all three together. Um, <clears throat> so... 16 Minutes of Pure Bliss is what Gail Herme Martins, I'm sorry, I, I botched that name bad. Um, that's what he, uh, they said, uh, Phoenix Dark, Phoenix Darkfall requested it, Project Hate Gaming, ah, dude, pick another name, man, that's, uh, hate's not cool. Uh, Luis Rodriguez and Fantastic Dimensions, um, have all requested the Mara Effect live. Although, I mean, uh, you know, looking at this, there are a lot of other recommendations as well. Um, Belcara, Beauty of Suffering, uh, Bleach Bath. But, while they all kind of requested uh, other songs to listen to, the Mara Effect is a thread that runs through all of the requests. So, let's get into the Spirit Box, the Mara Effect Trilogy of Songs. A simple bass riff, but really drives the song along. Yeah. This is in some sort of six uh, feel. Yep, it could also be felt in like a really slow uh, four. Ooh. That guitar is very crunchy. I'm. It has a lot of punch to it that I just was not expecting. Yeah, we're still in a six. Yeah. 
I like how she's using it in a verse this time rather than like in Rule of Nines where she uh, really only went heavy for the breakdown. I wonder if there's any significance to that or if she just wanted to scream at that part. Ooh, those blasts. That pickup's interesting because it's a three beat pickup. And uh, I was really expecting it to come back in on beat three and it comes back in on beat four. Got a very modern guitar solo here. So this isn't 100% live. Uh, there is a backing vocal track. So I'm going to say that it's a studio rendition of this live performance. Which is fine. That's actually something I would prefer. I love their ability to play with dynamics. They have sections that are real slow and calm and quiet and it ramps up it isn't this drastic you know immediate transition it's it's this build up that happens across the entire song and they seem to be really good at that So I'm going to assume this is where we move into part two. It has a very similar soundscape to uh, the first part. They're definitely sibling songs as far as uh, the sound. Uh, the general sound of the songs go. I'll get more into that later. Ooh, okay, maybe not. Dude, that drum is dragging. I think it's those same offbeat cymbal hits that he did in Rule of Nines. And it makes the drums feel like they're just behind the band. Interesting callback to the lyrics. She said she just said, where is love? And of course, the first part ended with uh, this is love. I like that little, uh, dog. a little, uh, like a pop accentuation.
So I don't know if that's actually a time signature change or just a time feel. I want to say the drums are just moving into a different feel because it lines up perfectly if you keep listening to the original uh, tempo and time signature. This part is weird. And I don't mean that in a negative way, I just mean it's... Full band syncopation here. I can get behind that. A lot of tension in the music that I think is amplified by her decision to use her fries here rather than her queens. Uh, so both the guitarist and the bassist had to switch to a different tuning, I'm going to assume. Uh, for this final part, which makes me think it's going to be a, a wildly different sound. I'm going to go with extremely calm or extremely heavy, depending on uh, if they're using higher tuned guitars or lower tuned guitars. Let's see where this part three goes. Maybe not necessarily softer or harder, just a different soundscape. Basically just a key signature change, but something that's easier to play on a different tuning. I think they did end up going with lower tuned guitars. Not by much. But this this sound uh, to me is uh, deeper. Uh, there's a, I don't know, just like a lower well. That's probably a horrible metaphor. I don't know, it's just what I think of when I listen to it. A little bit of funk in there. Strong use of a pedal note. Those random drum accents, man. Alright. You just... Not using that pedal note anymore.
that drummer's fills. I mean, he just tore it up this whole time. Yeah, these chords are a lot eerier, they have a lot more tension than the other two songs did. There's definitely an uneasy and unrest going on in this song uh, that wasn't really present in the other two, even in the heavier sections. This one's not syncopated like last time, but there is a, a cohesion between the bandmates on uh, accentuated beats. So it's, it's uh, I'll pick it up, I'll pick that thought up later. I'm curious what the Mara is. I kind of assumed that the Mara effect was something about somebody named Mara. But this makes it sound like it's a proper name. This is the Mara. Da -da. I think that's it. Yep. All right, spirit boxes, the Mara effect. Um. Dang, I got a lot of thoughts here, and I'm probably going to forget about a lot of the things I wanted to talk about because I mean that was 16 minutes of music, and uh. I have 16 minutes of thoughts that I'm probably not going to remember all of. So, um, dang. First thing I just want to talk about is the instrumentation. Um, there were, they, they jumped between basically two sounds. Uh, you had your heavy and you had your, your soft. And, uh, I thought it was very interesting that you go back and you listen to a lot of the softer sections and the guitar is actually playing very infrequently. Um, he's typically doing whole notes, half notes, uh, you know, he's holding out tones, usually going with the, uh, the tempo. And the tempo is a little slower in those sections, so he plays a little slower. But the bass and the drums are actually moving. They have very... Um, active parts going on even though it's still a slower uh, part of the song and they're not playing loud their their volume dynamic is still you know matching the intensity of the section but they have a lot of movement in their pieces the um, drummer has ghost notes on the snare he's doing eighth 
eighth, eighth or sixteenth notes on uh, cymbals, usually the quieter ones like the hi hat. Um, the bassist is usually doing a little bit of a bass run, not necessarily sixteenth notes, but he's moving faster than a guitarist, um, and it it creates this drive. Even though it's a slower section, it doesn't feel like it lacks the energy that the rest of the song does, and I think it's one of the reasons why. Um, all three of these songs just seem to mesh so well and they never seem to stall out or lose momentum. There's never any period where I would say the story of the music uh, was treading water or had no idea where it was going. The The song was always moving in a direction. Um, and I think a lot of that is because of the way that they compose momentum in the songs in the heavier parts it's very guitar driven and in the softer parts it's very bass and drum driven but there's always somebody who is moving faster than the tempo they're they're playing eighth or sixteenth it's not that they're rushing um they're just playing song or they're just playing melodies or rhythms that are pushing the song forward no there's never a point where every single instrument is um you know playing quarter or uh half notes so i think that's a really interesting way to go about looking at the music and um like i said ensuring that there isn't any part where the song uh gets boring that's not necessarily uh you can use that um to kind of make a point of the song where it feels like you have no direction it works thematically if your lyrics are about being lost uh, we saw that in Nothing But Thieves. Um, they did it a different way by uh, composing cyclical music that never resolved anywhere. But this is another way you can do it where um, instruments just play infrequently and it doesn't feel like there's any forward momentum um, in the melody lines or the bass lines or anything like that. Um, so they they used that to great effect to ensure that the song never really stagnated and always had forward momentum to it um i stated that the drummer uh was kind of a standout to me uh the bass you know had had some beautiful bass lines really tore it up a couple of times he got funky when he needed to he played subdued when he needed to um the guitarist had that solo to show off his uh you know his his range he had the tapping he had those uh whammy super vibratos i don't know what what you would call them um but it gets that uh that harsh dissonance that creates that warble when he just like hits the uh the whammy bar real quick um you know he's showing off some of the techniques that he can do uh he had a little bit of sweeping in there the lead singer is just you know she's fantastic she has um these very powerful growls or I think they're fries um and then she has her beautiful cleans and she can kind of uh edge some like airiness into it and get a very haunting sound she's very versatile and she showed off a lot of what she can do um but the drummer specifically I feel constantly showcased how good he is and I don't remember picking up on this on Rules of Nine. That was kind of a uh, a group effort to me. I don't think anybody really stuck out. But here, the drummer, I mean, every section or every two sections, he had a drum fill that was clean. Or he would play these weird time feels um, that somehow mixed into the song even though he was playing with different syncopation or different pulses than the rest of the band i mean he was just constantly um showcasing a mastery over both time and his instrument uh and that's uh i don't really want to say that he stole the show or that he uh you know, had all of my attention but he definitely uh piqued my interest several times uh, over the songs, whereas the rest of the bandmates had, you know, a time to shine. Um, the singer just was fantastic all the time, but there wasn't any real point that I was like immediately drawn to her, uh, part of the song, like I did with the drummer. I mean, when he did his fills or when he did his syncopations or his weird time feels, I mean, I immediately felt it. 
and I, my attention was immediately directed to him, and that happened several times. Uh, so, I mean, the instrumentation is just great all around. Uh, I was talking in during the song about their command over dynamics. And this is a huge shift from Between the Barry to Me, which I think was Thursday, where they had a ton of abrupt shifts. Their, their transitions would be basically between two different genres, and they were a beat apart. You would not really have much of an acclimation time to kind of see where you're going or to figure out where you're going or to kind of adapt to a new sound or new genre. And these guys did a great job of slowly transitioning. Their transitions were, were over many bars. And uh, it creates this seamless experience where the song slowly builds and slowly unbuilds. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why I'm blinking out on this. Uh, but you, you have all this tension and the sound and this volume and uh, basically all this layering and it builds up into this big idea. And then, you know, then they bring it back down and they, they reduce the size of the sound, uh, you know, for the next section. It, it, there isn't really much that is abrupt. There are a couple of very abrupt transitions where they'll shift from, um, like, the clean with, uh, with the quieter, the clean singing with the quieter instruments into the fry and the distortion. Um, but it's usually not very abrupt. There's usually a build-up to it. Uh, even when they go from the verse, which is typically quieter, to the heavier choruses, there's always that build-up. There's always a bar or two where they're kind of letting you know, okay, you know, we're going to get bigger now, and you can hear our volume increasing, and we're slowly going, and, you know, we're expanding our soundscape. Get ready for this. This is going to be a big thing. Uh, so... They have a strong command over that, and it reminds me a lot of um, early Deftones stuff. I don't know if anybody else picked that up. This song, I don't think Rule of Nines gave me that feel, but this song in particular, or these, this trilogy in particular, gave me a very Deftones feel in the best way possible. Um, just the way that they can go between like soft and sweet, to uh you know heavy metal and then have like an eerie unease to it they they just had this strong command over a lot of elements that i think uh makes deftones unique in the rock and metal world uh, let's see what else what else do i want to talk about there is some dang there was something I said. I'll get to that later, and uh, I just completely blanked on it. Um, I do want to talk about their time, though. They do a lot. Well, the first track, I think, was almost entirely done in 6. I don't know if it was 6.4 or 6.8. Um, but it had kind of a um, waltz thing going on, where instead of 6, you can count it in 3. And the first uh, beat would get a lot of emphasis where two and three won it. Um, so that's, I mean, that was pretty cool. But the weird thing is, is that I started to get lost. I don't remember if it was the first or the second. It was the first song. And I couldn't find one because the lead singer did this very, I don't want to say interesting or confusing, but it's done to misdirect. So confusing kind of fits. Um, uh, but she does pick up notes. She doesn't start singing on the first beat. She starts singing on the last beat of the previous bar. And that mixed with the odd syncopations in the drums makes that section very difficult to follow time wise. You can fall into the groove and just enjoy it. But if you're trying to count it out, figure out where one is and kind of dissect the composition of that area. It um it gets a little muddy, and I uh, I don't think I ended up picking up the uh, the the time ideas in that section. I 
pretty sure I would have to go back and give it another listen to kind of chart it out. Um, so that's, uh, that's something. I, I, it doesn't really tie into anything I was talking about, but I wanted to bring it up because uh, I thought it was interesting. Usually it takes more technical ideas, like with Meshuggah, where they are writing six or nine or 12 beat phrases over four, four. So they don't always, well, 12 would, 12 would line up, but they don't always line up with the bars, uh, with the downbeat of the bars for, you know, uh, an entire phrasing or even multiple phrasings before you get your melody and the musical bars lining back up. So, you know, it usually takes a lot of effort and forethought into polyrhythms to kind of pull that off. And I really appreciate that they did it here rather simply, simply by just having, uh, you know, the syncopated drums and then the pickup note. So, or the pickup notes. There were also a couple of sections where uh, she started to begin her musical phrase on a bar prior. And instead of the beat like uh, beat four of the bar prior, it was beat three and a half. So she ended up getting a beat and a half to for her pickup. And it really, for me, uh, having a bit of musical understanding and understanding tropes and what people normally do, it's very unsettling. It's offsetting. It's, um, it just gives that little bit of unease that, that their songs have in the, in the uh, gentler parts. Uh, because I'm expecting the downbeat to come, and it comes a half a beat later. And that's just, uh, it's like, it's like trying to walk a line when you're drunk, and you just, you, you get ready for the step, and then the step doesn't happen, and that's kind of what happens here. That's a horrible, that's horrible. I don't know where I'm going with that, but it's it's just disorienting. I'm expecting something to happen, and it happens half a beat later, and I kind of hope that you just understand that that's just disorienting because I can't really explain it. If it was a full beat later, I don't think it would be as jarring. It's that half beat, and I, I it has to be a very conscious decision to do that, and it creates a certain feel for people who understand music, either subconsciously or consciously. Uh, I, I think if you even took somebody who has no idea about musical theory, but they listen to a lot of pop music with the 4-4, they would find this jarring, even though they don't know why. Um, and like I said, it's a very conscious decision for them to write like this, I think, because the songs uh, appear to be about some sort of distress and unease. Speaking of what they appear to be about, I want to... Oh, well, geez, there are a lot of lyrics. Um, give me one second. We're going to jump cut right here. I'm going to read these real quick and see if I can't figure something out. All right. So I just read through all three songs' lyrics, and I, <laughs> I really have nothing to glean from this. Um, the first song seems to me uh, to be a bit of a love-hate relationship with a love relationship, if that makes any sense. Um, we have a lot of ideas about um, being together with someone or something. Uh, being suspended in time, but this someone or something is not exactly uh, a pure, non-toxic, loving, healthy relationship. Uh, she says their eyes are like razors; the edges can sharpen the line. Um, it has foot. It has crooked fingers that entwine. Um, and then she continues to say, "This is love. This is ordinary life." And I think it's more of a mantra to herself to pretend that whatever this relationship is, that it is what love is. Um, almost as a way to make herself believe that it's not an abusive relationship with whatever it is. Um, a lot of the imagery lends me to kind of think of uh, demons or possession or like some sort of uh, spiritual connection to something malevolent maybe 
but it could just be a very strong metaphor for, like I said, a regular old toxic relationship with another human being. Um, but she even seems to want the negativity of it. She says, I want the mess. I want to ignite the fire. I want to lie in severance. Leave me to cut my teeth. Um, almost as if she thinks she deserves this for some reason. Uh, and then the end of the song is a repetition of this is love and make it stop and just kind of uh, moving between those two sentences. But as for parts two and three, I I can't say I have any idea what's going on in them at all. Two appears to be about being stuck someplace with something malevolent. Um, there are a lot of uh, descriptive sentences about um, something being a serpent and uh, always being watched, having a mirror. And I'm just, I don't know. And then three, three has a lot of visual metaphor going on that I'm just not connecting. So unfortunately, I can't really tie all this into what I want to get into next, which is the musical identities of the songs. The first two uh, have a similar soundscape, and the third one is a drastic change of form. And part of that comes from changing the guitars. And like I said during the song, I'm fairly certain they, they went to lower tuned, at least the guitar was lower tuned. I'm pretty sure the bass was too. Uh, there is a, a heaviness, there is an extra depth um, in the third song that isn't present in the other two, and you can really hear it in the heavy sections. And I think that it actually matches her fries a lot better than the heavy sections in the first two songs. Um, the third song also has a lot of unease, unrest, this eeriness going on that uh, that simply isn't present in the first two tracks. Whoa. Uh, it simply isn't present in the first two tracks. Sorry about that with the lighting. Um, and I think it goes along with the lyrics. It, I mean, it, it has to. These lyrics in the third part are very poetic. There's a lot of um, metaphor going on in the first two tracks, but they end up getting more and more cryptic as the songs go on. And like I said, on the third one, we have something that on the surface is kind of lacking an idea outside of malevolence and like I said I, I can't really gleam anything from it without really dissecting it there's a lot there's a lot going on on probably at least two levels these are some very very deep lyrics um, but like I said the sound of the song is a lot darker, it's a lot creepier, it's a lot, uh, there, there's just a lot of tension in it that the first two don't have. And I still have no idea what the effect of the Mara is, I don't know what the Mara is. Um, like I said, I kind of assumed it was a person, it was this person's effect that she has on people, um, or on the world around her. And I, I don't, I don't know. But I do want to touch on something interesting. Um, a lot of people said that you can't really listen to just one track out of this, that it is a trilogy of songs. And that made me think that it was going to be three connected songs. And it actually isn't. Uh, the songs have a lot of non-diegetic audio that connects them. And what I mean by that is that the audio doesn't come from any of the instruments. There isn't a, a musical connection between the songs. 
The songs have a very clear start and ending point. They do not actually run into each other melodically or through chord progression. They're tied together by ambient sounds uh, that have nothing to do with the song itself, at least uh, on a first-time listen. I assume that maybe all the voices or the... Um, what is that the static that's going on? Maybe that's, I mean, maybe there's uh, metaphorical elements to that. But the songs themselves have very distinct start and ending uh, parts, and they don't run into each other uh, and create one very long track. Now, I think this is important to point out because that doesn't mean that it's any less of a connected trilogy of songs. All three of them have very strong thematic aspects, all three of them have very strong uh, musical aspects there there's a lot of crossover in musical ideas there's a lot of crossover in lyrical ideas uh, I mentioned uh, just what I heard when they were singing that track one ends by her singing this is love and track two begins it is the fifth line down um, I try to scream please say anything the frequencies ringing it out where is love uh, so there are some lyrical themes going on in these as well. But uh, I'm just pointing out that it's not what I was expecting. Um, I kind of figured when people said that this was, uh, you know, a trilogy of tracks that they were going to run together and create a long 16-minute song. So, all right, I think I have spoken enough about this song so far, and I am more than intrigued. I will probably be hitting up some sort of song analysis website or group and see if anybody's dissected these lyrics because they I mean I'm drawn to them they are some very powerful visuals I just have no idea what they're saying unfortunately but that is why I am a musician and not a uh lyrical writer I don't know I can analyze music all day. I really try to tie in the lyrics, especially if I think that they're they're moving with the themes of the music. Uh, but unfortunately, at this point, I just I can't make that connection as much as I would like to because I I guarantee that the themes running here match the themes in the music very well. Yeah, uh, I I get that feeling. I just can't make the connection to. To explain why, unfortunately. So that is Spirit Box, the Mara Effect, parts one, two, and three. Make sure you guys let me know what you thought and let me know if this video ran on too long because it's 43 minutes. Holy jeez. Uh yeah, so I'm gonna wrap this up. Don't want to make this any longer. Like, subscribe, comment, ring the bell, and I will be back tomorrow, 11 a.m. as usual, with another returning band. Until then, you all have a fantastic day. And, uh, no, no, yeah, until then, have a fantastic day.